We may be called an HK world, but that doesn't mean we don't focus on matters out of this world every now and then. And development in that area has become fiercely competitive. The U.S. leads the way, followed by closely by China. Traditional space powers like Europe and Japan remain active, and India is rapidly emerging as a major, power, major player. Now, a new group is gaining attention, emerging space nations. Over the past decade, more than 20 countries and regions have established or reorganized space agencies, including Australia. And NHK World's Yokokawa Hiroshi was in that country last month, looking into the push there. He joins us now to tell us what he's learned. So, Hiroshi, what stood out to you about Australia's space development? Sure. So, its location is notable. Being closer to the equator gives it certain advantages when it launches rockets. And being in the southern hemisphere offers a special position in regard to space observation. But what especially interesting is how the country is leveraging its strengths in specific technologies. I visited the National Science Agency, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Organization near Brisbane. It has been working on a device that scans the surrounding environment and converts that data into 3D images. I tried it out myself, as you can see. It's being developed in collaboration with NASA and Boeing. It's being tested aboard the Japanese Kibo module on the International Space Station. It knows precisely where it is and where it needs to go. And remarkably, it moves around and captures detailed 3D models on, uh, all on its, all its own. CSIRO over the last few years has been growing its portfolio of research in space technologies and we felt that this could be one key project in that portfolio of research to help um, enable CSIRO to build space heritage in space technology development. Interestingly, uh, this technology was originally developed down under, I mean really down under, it was for mining operations. Australia's vast landmass has give, uh, driven innovation in large autonomous machinery and remote management systems for mining. Something else key in a lot of industries is the work of startups. Uh, tell us how they factor into this. Sure. So Australia is actively encouraging them to enter the sector. Mm. It has set up facilities across the country to cultivate venture companies related to space development. Mm. I visited one of them at the University of Technology, Sydney. There are advantages for startups as well as the school. It has a simulator worth about 1.3 million US dollars, and it replicates the shaking and acceleration of rocket launches. Startups can use this kind of equipment through partnerships with the school. Students get to be involved too. Uh, some have actually been hired by the startups afterward. So it's a win win for both. Space was very much the preserve of the world's major superpowers and, and, and the, you know, their prime industries uh, contributing to that. If you look today, it's a very diverse space sector. That's probably what I say. It's just, just you know, we are in, in this emerging, growing phase, and, and that has challenges, but incredible amount of opportunity as well. Mm, so, Hiroshi, why is Australia placing such importance on space development? Mm -hmm. So, it has become useful for many areas in, in forest fire detections, for example, and as mentioned earlier, in the mining sector. And it's important in every country, really, including for weather forecasting, communications, and GPS for cars and smartphones. And it's also vital for national security. The conflicts in Ukraine has shown why. The country uses SpaceX Starlink satellite network for communications. Australia and others do not want to fall behind, so competition is only heating up. But more players mean more problems. There is still a lack of clear rules. For example, space debris is becoming a major issue. Leading nations will need to work together to ensure that space remains safe and sustainable for everyone.